Now in this video, we're going to be going through the new service procedures we're going to need to do on gas boilers according to the new part L of the building regulations. So, stop messing around and let's get on with it. Now, before we service any gas boiler, first thing we're going to be needing is the manufacturer's instructions. And if the customer hasn't got the manufacturer's instructions, you're going to need to download them and print them. Because according to our regulations, you can't install, service or repair a gas appliance without these said instructions. We also may need specialist service kits for the appliance if you're stripping and cleaning the heat exchanger. So make sure before you go and service these appliances, you've got all the correct materials you need and all the correct tools as well. Now, before we actually get our hands on the appliance, there are a few things we need to do. We need to do a quick visual assessment of the appliance, but before we touch the appliance, we'll need to carry out the safe to touch test using a non-contact voltage indicator. So, I need to go to a known supply, plug socket. I need to test the non-contact voltage indicator to prove it's working. I can then come to the appliance and I can gently touch the appliance and all the pipe work underneath to make sure there's no stray voltage here. And I also need to go to the gas meter. I need to make sure I touch the meter itself. I need to make sure I touch the bracket, the regulator, the anaconda and the ECV. So I need to make sure everything's got no stray voltage. I then need to come back to the known supply and test it again. Once I'm happy that this is still working, it's now safe to touch the appliance. Now this is not the safe isolation procedure. That's completely different. And we only need to do the safe isolation procedure if we are going into the appliance in the live voltage side, the 230 volt side, which we won't be doing today on this service, but we will be proving that the appliance is not working. Now again, before we start getting our sticky little mitts on the appliance, we need to make sure this appliance is working because we don't want to fall for it will work before you touched it. So what I always do is get the hot tap, turn the hot tap on and make sure the boiler fires up. As you can hear, the appliance has fired up. That's the first one. Now, next thing I need to do oh, is get the thermostat, because this has worked off a time clock and a thermostat. And what I need to do now is, saying it's 15 degrees, I need to go above 17 degrees, which it is today. So I'll just set it to 24 degrees. And I'm looking for a green light to come on here. There's the green light. And you can hear the appliances coming on. There you go, it's fired up. You can now turn the stat down. Whatever, as long as it's lower than 17 degrees, it will go off. The green light will go off. And the boiler shuts down. So I've now proved to myself that the boiler is working, but you don't want to run it too long because we are going to be stripping and doing a full service on this boiler. Let's do a visual inspection of the flue. So first thing we need to check and make sure we've got the screws in the flue system because our glowworm and valence need that. Our test points are there. Our seal's done. We're all sealed up there. So that's all done. So that's the flue system on the inside has passed. So if we check the flue on the outside, first thing we need to do is make sure it's sealed, which it is, and it's working okay. And it's more than two meters off the ground, so we don't need a terminal guard. And we will also need to check the condensate pipe. So you can see we've got Condensate Pro on here. And if you didn't have any of this insulation stuff, then you should be advising your customers that it's under the regs now that a condensate needs to be insulated. So that's checking the flue and the condensate on the outside. 
Now, next thing I'm going to do is go off and do a tightness test. Now, according to Regulation 26.9 of the Gas Safety Installation and Use Regulations 1998, which was amended in 2018, it says we don't need to do a tightness test on a service. But for my customers, I always offer a full service and I always do a tightness test in there. I also, when I'm teaching it, I also teach my trainees to make sure you do a tightness test. Now there'll be some guys out there who'll be arguing you, with you all day long saying you're looking for work, are you going to create a leak? But what if the customer has got a leak? With the prices of gas at the moment, we want our customers not to be wasting gas. So, I always do a tightness test. Not necessary according to the regulations, but for me, it's peace of mind for the customer. So let's get over to the meter and let's do a tightness test. First of all, let's do a visual inspection. We have done the safe to touch, but as you can see, the gas meter is a U6. It is on a bracket. There is tamper seals in place and the shear bolts have been sheared. We've got a tatty old regulator. We've got the anaconda, which isn't stretched. The little signs of corrosion on there. We have the identification tape to tell the customer which way the ECV needs to go. See the ECV is at the back there, and the ECV will fall to off when uh, it's turned off. And we've got earth bonding within 600 of the meter or before the first branch. Now the wires you can see in here are dead burger alarm wires, which I haven't actually taken out yet. But there you go, they're not live. So that's our visual inspection done on the gas meter. So shall we get this tightness test done then? Now to carry out my tightness test procedure, I'm using my TPI SP620, which is connected to my phone. And what I can do with this, I can populate all my information onto a report, which I can then email onto the customer. So using something like this is perfect when you're doing servicing because it gives you a record of receipt for the customer makes it a uh, damn sight easier. Now also, I'm just going to take out the test nipple. Now I always use a 10 millimeter socket when I'm doing this. You could use a flat screwdriver if you want, but I prefer to use this. I need to turn the gas supply off. And now I need to do my tightness test procedure. So I'll get on with that and I'll catch you after I've done the test. Now, tightness test completed and I have saved all the information in my phone. Didn't budge a millimetre. So while I'm still at the meter, I can do some other tests now. So I've set my TPI SP620 up onto live pressure readings. And I am reading a standing pressure at the moment of 252 millibars so that's no appliances running so i'm going to turn my hot tap on with my temperature set to maximum on the boiler and let's see what our working pressure is at the meter when it's on maximum so you can probably hear the tap running in the background and i've got a working pressure at the meter of at the moment 20.6 20.7 20.8 20.9 so that's what my working pressure is at the moment so when I do my inlet pressure to the appliance I cannot have more than a one millibar drop between my working pressure at the meter and my working pressure at the appliance uh, let's drop it down to 20 now so it's up and down like it will do because the boiler is a modulating boiler so that's standing pressure working pressure so what I need to do now is go and turn the tap back on. Now what I need to do is disconnect my manometer. But some of you will be saying, he didn't purge. I didn't need to purge because I didn't allow any air into the system. So you don't need to purge if you don't let, allow any air into the system. So as long as I didn't go below the seven millibars, which I didn't, I think I did my lap by at nine millibars, then there's no need to purge. So I'm going to disconnect the hose, quickly put in the test nipple 
And again, I haven't disconnected my, turned my gas off. There's no need to turn my gas supply off because I'm doing this quickly. And the little bit of gas it is allowing into the air is negligible. So I can now tighten this back up, but obviously not too tight because I don't want to snap it. And then I need my leak detection fluid to test the test nipple and make sure that that isn't letting by. Oops, which it doesn't seem to be doing. Looks pretty good, so I just need to wipe off the excess and uh, we're finished at the meter now. So that's all the test I'll need to do now is actually start at the boiler. Now I've isolated the power at the boiler and I need to take the front cover off. So I need to get a T20 because there are two screws, one here and one here. And as you can see, we're now in the boiler. Now this cover forms the seal around the boiler casing. So you've got to make sure as you take the cover off that you check all the seal around the boiler is in good condition. And obviously if it isn't, it will need replacing. So make sure you test the seals. Now we're inside the boiler, the first thing we need to do is give it a good visual inspection. So what I'm looking for is any leaks inside the boiler, uh, which there doesn't seem to be. <sighs> Signs of an old leak, but uh, there isn't anything wet in here at all. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take the heat engine out and I'm going to inspect inside there and see what it's like. So let's get on with that then. Now first thing I've got to do is again with my T20 is undo this screw here for the silencer. That's the way I see. I need to pull this down and wiggle it off which isn't the easiest thing to do in the world on these. As you can see, I thought I broke it then, but I didn't. No, nope, I didn't. So, um, what I'm going to do is disconnect some wires now. So I've got a wire on the gas valve there, which I can take off. I've got these wires on the spark generator because this is coming off and the spark generator is also part of it. So I need to take that off. Technically don't need to take that off, but I need to take the earth off. That's out of the way, and I need to take the fan wire off. So that's out. So that's the wires out. Next thing I need to do is change to my 10 milli socket. Now in the kit I've got, there are new nylock nuts. So I need to remove those. Now, I need to disconnect the gas supply. I've left one nut on there to keep it in position for me. So I need to go underneath the boiler and turn off the gas. So that's the gas off. And I need to get on this nut at the back here to undo the gas supply. And again, this gas connection comes in the um, service kit we've got. So now, all I'm gonna do now is undo this last nut, put it on the top and pull it forward. And it exposes inside the heat exchanger. So, Heat exchanger is going to take a bit of cleaning, so let's get on with cleaning the heat exchanger and then we'll have a look at 
the heat engine itself. Now I have a specialist cleaning tool for cleaning inside this stainless steel heat exchanger. Now this is going to take a while so what I'll do is I'll uh, start cleaning in between all the different 10 milli tubes and when I've done that I'll get back to you. They all seem to be clear now, so that's the end of using that. Now, the next thing I use for cleaning the heat exchanger is just get one of these pan cleaners. So this has got not metal on it, because really what you don't want to be doing is you don't want to be cleaning inside here with a wire wool or a Brillo pan or something like that, what's made of metal. These are perfect, these little, they're called scotch pads. Anyway, what I could do is, I could get a very mild um, vinegar solution and spray the vinegar inside. I've actually done a video on how to clean these heat exchangers. I'll put a link in the comment section down below so you can find that so you can see how I did it. But I don't think it's that bad, this, that it's going to require vinegar. It's just going to need a bit of elbow grease. So, I'll get this cleaned up, and again, I'll get back to you. So, that'll do for now. Just kind of worn that away. Now, what we need to do is, once we've cleaned it out, we need to uh, get a cup We'll talk about between this season, will we? Eh? Anyway, so what we need to do is just get some water in here and just clear out the bottom, and you can hear it going down and going into the trap. So that will just get rid of any loose debris. Now, just be careful, guys, when you're doing this cleaning here that you don't damage the insulation plate at the bottom so uh, just bear that in mind so tons better than it was so we need to prepare now the heat engine before we put that back in to the boiler now let's open this seal up and show you what we get inside here we can open it up So when you open it up, we have the gasket itself, so we get one of those, we get an instruction kit, we get a bit of, I guess that's silicon grease, we get a bag with the nylock nuts in and the connections. Now this is the gasket for the CXI ones which we won't need, so if we needed to change the electrodes we've got a gasket there as well. So that's basically all you get in this kit, and that's all we need. So the first thing I'm going to do is, I'm going to put the new gas connection on, so we don't forget that, because that's important. So you've got a gas connection here, if it was for a valent, and the gas connections there for the glow ones. So let's get the gas connection on. Now I'm just going to use a flat screwdriver, just to flick off the old gasket. <laughs> I'm down there somewhere. And then I'm just going to put the new one on which is a quite a tight fit and that's where it needs to be otherwise it keeps falling off so just be careful of that and again every time you take this off you will need to put a new gasket on let's get the heat engine all changed now so you can see the gasket here and this gasket is quite flat but still got quite a bit of meat on it so you can see that now this is the spark electrodes and we need to clean those up with a file. Now the gap on the spark electrode needs to be about 4 millimeters, 
and you can't really do this with wire wool you actually do need a file to do this You have to be quite rough, but not rough enough to snap it. Now try and keep your hands off the cup as well, because your greasy fingers can affect the cup burner. We are going to give that a wipe. Just try and keep your greasy fingers off it. But this is quite important that you clean all this off, all this rust off, otherwise it will start sparking across here rather than where it is supposed to do here and you can check that with a multi meter to make sure you've got continuity on the ends from down at the bottom here so that looks good now we just check the insulation make sure there's no cracks in there and then we can get our little flat screwdriver and we need to prise off the seal so now you can see what I mean about which way the seal goes. So actually this goes down to the bottom and this is what seals on the heat exchanger. And they normally break at this bit here when you come and take them off like this one has. So now what we've got to do is get our little flat screwdriver and get this off because it will stop us getting the new one in. And I always put the new seal in the same place. Again you don't have to worry about scratching it because the seal is going to be down there but we do need to get rid of this excess. So like I say this is what goes into the groove, this is what goes onto the face. So I'm just going to put that back where it was in the position and they are quite tight to get in but you will feel it squash in. Just be careful not to damage it. You can properly feel it push in. So that's in. Now we can just get our sponge again and just wipe around the cup burner itself get rid of any excess dust and get rid of your dirty fingerprints again that's all you need to do with the actual burner So that's reassembling this heat engine, so now we can get it back into the boiler. I'm not actually sure what this stuff is, but it says to put it around the nuts here. So if you know what it actually is, if you're a valent or a glowworm engineer and you know what it is, let me know. Because it's like a paste, looks like copper slip. If you know what copper slip is. So it just says to put it around the, the, the bolts, or the studs. So, don't say you can't use your finger. But it actually looks like copper slip. Maybe it's to stop the thread seizing it, I don't know. But I'm doing what it's told me to do in the instructions. First time I've seen this, to be fair. Um, is that right? Anyway, it's messy. It's a messy one. As long as we don't get it where the seal goes. We're alright. Also, you can see this bit here is where the old seal was and we need to get that flat again so I need to scrape that off after I've washed my hands. Now when I'm putting the heat engine back in what I do is I get my gas connection on first 
So move all the wires out of the way. Slide that on to the nut just to hold it in place for me. And the stud, sorry, to hold it in place for me. And I need to get this gas connection on. Making sure the o-ring is still on before I tighten the nut up, which it is, and then just hand tighten this on. Now I've got the gas connection on, that can slide in place for me. And I'll tighten that up properly. Well, I'll hand tighten it. So, check it's not cross threaded. Doesn't look like it is. Because it's gone right to the end. Now, I've replaced the four nylock nuts. Now, this one here is important you do it first. Now, you do get five in here for the valent. So, if you do mess up, you can replace them, but you've got to make sure you do it. You put this back first, because if you don't, you'll need to change the nut again. So don't forget to put that on. That's the bracket for the silencer tube. So that on. Now I always put them on diagonally. And tighten them up diagonally so I don't twist the burner door because it is like a thick aluminium not stainless steel well oh, they do slip on really well with that stuff off whatever it is it does, like I say it does look like copper slip right what I need to do now is get these tightened up diagonally now there is a torque setting for this but does anybody actually do the torque setting and anybody know what the torque setting is but I do them till the tight Tightening up diagonally as I'm going along. So, catch you when I've done that. So, that's tightening up the gas supply. What I need to do now is actually turn it on because I'm going to test for leaks. And we need to turn the gas supply back on. So, I need to get my leak detection fluid. Just wipe it on the nut to see if it bubbles up. Leave it for a few seconds and let's see how that goes. I need to wipe this excess leak detection fluid off now. It's tested, no leaks. Also, if you've got one of these cane gas sniffers, you can use that to see whether you've got a gas leak, which we don't seem to have. If you don't trust your leak detection fluid. And now we can get all the electrical connections on. So, that's the last gas connection on. Now what I like to do is, before we go any further now, uh, turn the power supply back onto the boiler and I can run the appliance. So the power supply is just up here. The supply is back on. Check. Yep, power supply is back on. So what I'm gonna do now is, I'm just gonna turn the tap on, let it run, see if it fires up, and then I'm going to run my hand around here and check there is no heat coming out of there. Now, I do this, and I'm also going to do a sweep test around here to check if we've got any products of combustion coming out. I think I'd rather just spin a little end of my fingers rather than leave it to melt the internals of the boiler. But be careful, if you don't want to do this, then just do the sweep test. So, fingers crossed it fires up. Oh, I straight away. And you can see through the little blue window. So, seems to have put everything back so far. So, I'm just going to gently run my fingers around the edge 
I got a few of them be shopping. Ah, well, like I say, I'd rather just take my uh, end of my finger off. So everything seems pretty good there. Also, I like to get a spanner now rather than a socket so I can feel it and just give them a little nip up and just check and make sure they're not loose. Again in a diagonal, they're pretty tight when I did them first time. So they're good, everything looks good in there. So uh, get the silencer back on. invented this <laughs> it is really tight to get on you have to widen it on and then once it's on and in place let's make sure the wires are trapped by it you can just put the screw back in Be a bit quieter now, just make sure I've not pulled any wires off. And away we go again. So, that's getting it back together. What we're going to do now is clean the trap out. Under here. Now the trap for this is under here, but it's not very good because when you want to do it, all the water pours out. So I've got a pan out of the pan drawer. I'll tell the wife. So I'm just going to put that under there, which should just give me enough room to undo the trap. So that's the debris out of, <laughs> don't really see that, but that's the debris when we clean the heat exchanger. <laughs> so uh, need to clean that out now. So before I put this back now, I'm gonna put some water in here, just to fill it up. And then I can put it back in. Uh, I've spilled it all over the place anyway, so it won't make much difference. So that's made the trap again. Make sure I haven't pulled the actual condensate pipe off, which is back on there. So let's mop up the water. Now I'm just going to check the expansion vessel. So I've isolated underneath the boiler, got rid of the water out the drain, uh, kept the drain open. So I'm just going to connect my pump onto the Schreiner valve on the expansion vessel and see what pressure we've got in there. So we're looking between, well, about 0.8 of a bar. Gonna be quick or we'll lose it. Oh. And as you can see, we've got 0.8. Let's just put it up to one because uh, I need to get it back off. And I am gonna lose a little bit. Now, before we put it, uh, the dust cap back on, if I can get it in there, yes, good shot. We need to spray the Schreiner valve with leak detection fluid to make sure it's not passing. And it doesn't seem to be, so we can wipe off the excess LDF and we can put our cap back on. So that's testing the expansion vessel, something I don't really do all the time, unless I deem it necessary. 
uh, but just make sure the boiler is actually empty of water before you test it. So let's check in the expansion vessel. Now that's pretty much the cleaning. It's now all about testing the boiler and make sure it's working properly. Now the first thing I need to do is my pressure gauge is reading 0.8 here so between 0.5 and 1 bar is what you need to put these at it all depends on the size of your system and pressures in expansion vessels and stuff like that so uh, I need to put, top it up a little bit so my filling loop is external on here so I'm just going to top that up I'm just going to open the filling loop under here and let the water come in till it reads one bar what we'll do, I can isolate underneath here now so that's topping the boiler up what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do my gas rating and I'm going to do my pressures so I'm going to go to the gas meter now and I'm going to gas rate in hot water and central heating. Now this is an old uh, U6 meter which is in cubic feet so I've got a test dial not uh, numbers so the first thing we're going to do is I always write it on the back of the manufacturer's instructions so I'm going to wait till it gets to a full figure and then I'm going to start my stopwatch I'm going to wait till it gets to half past so started my watch and I'm going to time how long it does one full revolution in seconds. So that's taken one minute and five seconds. So 65 seconds. Now we're in May and it is quite warm today and I know we've only got a poor flow rate here at the house. We've only got, it's, it's about nine litres at its best. So that gives me a little bit of concern when I'm testing hot water because it should have been a lot quicker than that. <laughs> but I'm going to test my flow rate and my temperatures at my tap to make sure I've got the right temperature coming out at that tap and the right flow rate. So I'm going to work out how many kilowatts this is coming out at and then I'm going to do the central heating. Now the gas rate on hot water has only come out at 15 kilowatts. So I told you it's a bit of a concern. But anyway, we'll have a look at that in a minute. Now this is good for having you know, walk around stats. I can turn the heating on from here. So away goes the boiler. So I'm just going to wait till it gets to a full figure again at the top. I'm going to wait till it gets to 12 o'clock this time and then I'm going to start my stopwatch. So I'm not going to give it that much time to set, you know, to run because it should be on low fire. Now if you had weather compensation when you're trying to do this at this time of the year, that can also affect what your boiler is using. But when you are servicing a boiler, you want to know what it's doing, not what it can do. So that's why I don't gas rate in high and low settings like a lot of guys do. High and low settings is just for flue gas analysing. A non-condensing boiler wouldn't have those settings, would it? So I'm just seeing what it's doing, not what it can do. So that's why I'm gas rating in hot water and central heating. Now this boiler is a 28 kilowatt boiler. So I'm hoping this water is going to be quite hot coming out of the tap. <laughs> Let me go back and check it. So now 2 minutes and 4 seconds. So let's do the maths. Now my heating has come out at 7.8 kilowatts net. Now I've actually range rated my boiler down to 10 kilowatts. So instead of giving me 24 kilowatts, I think it gives in central heating, I've done it to 10 kilowatts because the average heating in the UK is six to eight kilowatts. And mine's coming out at 7.87 kilowatts net. So when I originally installed the boiler, been fiddling around with it over the last years, a few years or so, I've actually range rated it down. I'll save that for another video to show you how I range rate it down. So uh, that's what we're getting. So I'm going to go to the tap now. I'm going to check my flow rate. I'm going to check my temperature rise and see exactly why my, on hot water I only got 15 kilowatts to see whether there actually is a fault. Well, I haven't noticed a fault. So let's go and have a look. 
Now let's find out why this gas rate is low on the hot water. Now the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to test the cold water flow rate and the temperature. Now we've fitted this fancy water saving tap which is supposed to give us 9 litres. So turn the tap on and what have we got? Well according to my little wake up here we have bang on 9 litres. Let's see what temperature we've got coming out. So I've got my little temperature probe. I'm going to slide it in the hole there. It's going down from 21 degrees at the moment. Now, this time of the year we should be having, I don't know, 11, 12, 13 degrees centigrade in our cold water. At the moment we're on... 13.6 12 12.6 12 12.3 We seem to be steady now at 12 degrees So our cold water flow rate is 9 litres a minute at we just dropped to 11.9 degrees centigrade so that's the cold water we've got coming in. Let's find out what the hot water is. So let's see what the flow rate is first. Uh, the flow rate on that is around 8 litres. So just a little bit less. Uh, creeping up a little bit. It's about 8, between 8 and 9 litres. So boiler fired up as you can see, get the temperature in and straight away you can hear the boiler is modulating down because the flow rate is so low. Obviously if we had a faster flow rate we would be having cooler water. So straight away we've gone to 48, 50, we're at 50 now. Now I've just set this to maximum to see what we get coming out of the boiler. So this is set on a flow rate of 60 degrees. But the lower you can have this temperature, the better. So if you have to put cold water in a bath when you've filled it, you've wasted heat. Now it does take a lot of messing around and a lot of practice, but over the three times of the year, you should be able to adjust your flow temperature on your hot water. Uh, by just reducing it on the boiler so whatever you need in your bath without adding any cold water because as soon as you add that cold water you've wasted energy so we've got 56.5 degrees here now which is far too hot because we have a dishwasher and so we don't need to wash the pots at really high temperatures and because it's a combi boiler we don't need to store the hot water so we don't need to worry about Legionella. So we could actually reduce this temperature which we do to round about we do about 48 degrees on the boiler as my wife still likes a hot bath. So we're steady at 56 degrees there. So that's why our boiler is gas rating so low because the flow rate's so low and the boiler is a 28 kilowatt. So just remember if you want to save energy because it's a bit pricey at the moment and the more we can save the better we're going to be. So if you reduce your temperature on your hot water and you reduce your flow temperature on your central heating you'll save probably between 10 and 20 percent on your gas bill at the moment. So just bear that in mind. So hopefully that's proved now why we've only got a low gas rate on our hot water. Now before I put the cover on I just want to do a sweep test around this heat engine. So I've got my TPI DC710. I've got it running off my phone. I'm just going to put the hot tap on. And what I'm going to do is once it fires up for two minutes I'm going to go around the heat engine and see if I've got any products of 
combustion coming out of this heat exchanger. This is a must when you're changing these gasket seals. So just slowly go around to see if we're picking up any CO or CO2. Slowly around. Bracket is. So it's not picking any carbon and monoxide, so no CO up, and it's not picking any CO2 up at the moment. It's picking up 29 at uh, 20.9% oxygen, and we're doing a temperature of. Uh, 38.3 degrees. Now I'm going to do this for two minutes. When that's complete, I'll get back to you. Now that's the sweep test complete, and I didn't get any CO or any CO2, so that's a good sign. Um, so that's all I've got to do inside here now, all the other tests I need to put the cover back on. So I'm going to get the cover back on and then we can flue gas analyse this. Now I've set the uh, boiler into low mode and I'm just running it now. So when you're analysing a boiler you need to run it to minimum of 15 minutes to a maximum of 30 or two to get a stable reading. So what I'm getting at the moment on low mode is I'm getting 6 ppm on CO, just gone to 7. We've got 8.4% and we've got a ratio of 0 0.0001. So not looking too bad so far. Need to check it with the manufacturer's instructions, but at the moment that's looking good. So all I need now to do is put it in high mode and see what happens then. So now I've put it into P2. You can now hear the boiler as giving it a little bit more gas. Our CO has gone up to 44. Our CO2 is at 8.2. So I've just turned it on. We just need to leave it for a little bit now just to stabilise. And uh, we'll see what the readings are once we've done. So now the boiler's been running a short while now. We've still got a very low... CO of 41 ppm. We've see, still got 8.5 on the CO2 and we've got a ratio of 0 0.0005 so we're well under with the ratio. Now we need to check the manufacturer's instructions to see what our CO2 level is but I would always advise never adjust the CO2 readings when you've just serviced the boiler because you could be actually throwing it massively out because we have and a lot of dirt and stuff like that we've had flying around the heat exchanger but for what I know about these boilers that's looking pretty good so that's analyzing all we've got to do now is our flue integrity test just to make sure the flue is good now um, on my flue integrity testing I've had to open the tap because the boiler keeps knocking off on high so I've got a CO of one part per million I've got a CO2 of 0 and I've got a oxygen reading of 20.9 with a flue temperature of uh, 24 degrees. So that's the flue integrity testing and everything's tickety blue on this flue. Good sign of whether the flue's got any problems is when you take the casing off and you get a load of water in the bottom but I haven't got that. So that's the flue integrity testing. Now I could test it on low as well, so I'm going to test it on low, but that's how you do flue gas analysing on high and low. If you want to see how you put different other boilers on high and low settings, again I will leave a link to the video in the description below. So, so far, this boiler's looking good. And when you've finished analysing, always make sure you put your sample point covers back on whether it's on your flue integrity test one or when it's on the main sample point for your products of combustion because you don't want to leave an ID or an at-risk situation.
And the final flue gas analyzer test to do is the sweep test. So again, I'm going to sweep around the turret. I'm going to sweep around the flue system. And I'm going to go around the boiler casing, making sure I haven't got any products of combustion coming out of the boiler. So again, I've had to put the tap on because the boiler's up to temperature and keeps knocking off. So I'm just going around the casing, going around the turret, and this also helps you not to get to put the caps back on the inspection point so we get that on. So two minute test, looking for less than 10 parts per million of CO coming into the room. Don't forget any wire grommets underneath or where the pipes go through. And at the moment, zilch. Now one of the things most guys wouldn't even dream of thinking about on a service will be checking our flow and return temperatures. Now I've only got a flow temperature of 50 degrees on here. Um, and then we, we slightly increase it over um, the year because we haven't got weather comp. But at this time of the year, we've only got a flow temperature of 50 degrees. So technically it doesn't really matter what our return temperature is coming back because if your flow temperature is 50 degrees, your return temperature could get up to 50 degrees, which is ours virtually as because I've been flue gas analyzing and all the rest of it. And it's just circulating around the heat in them. It's quite warm today, so we're not getting rid of a lot of the heat. So it's important now that you check your flow and return temperatures on a service and kind of explain to the customer about reducing the flow temperatures if they haven't got weather comp, reducing it back during the springtime. Obviously summer's not going to be on and then autumn increasing it a little bit and then winter putting it back up and you can just hear the boilers fired back up again. So we've like say i've got this set at a flow temperature of 50 degrees i have been doing flue gas analyzing so it's kind of messed up these readings but it's important to do flow and return temperatures and just remember the more you can reduce your temperatures whether it's for the hot water or the central heating the more money the customer is going to save in fuel the more gas they're going to save the more co2 they're going to stop putting into the atmosphere that's flow and return temperatures. Put in the comments down below if you think I'm talking nonsense. Now, our next test is one of the most commonly missed tests when you're servicing a boiler, is testing the safety devices. So all I'm gonna do is, turn on the hot tap, let the boiler fire up. So we can now see it's fired up and all I'm going to do is turn off the gas supply while the water is running and what should happen is we should go to a full code. So the boiler's trying to fire again. Try it again. Having another go. And this is the fourth time, I think. Should lock out now. There we go. So it's come up with the fault. So that's how we test the safety devices. So all I have to do is turn the tap back off, open the gas back up, and press the reset button. I need a pen. I found the pen. Press the reset button in. So 
Simple as that. So it should fire up again. There it goes. So that's how you test the safety devices. So I'm just testing my inlet pressures now. So again, I've got my SP620 connected to the test point down at the bottom. Got my hot tap running and I've got an uh, inlet pressure of 19.8, keeps jumping between 19.6 to 19.8. So that's my inlet pressures on hot water. Put me on back to me, keeps knocking off all the time. But anyway, still the same. So we've got 19.6. That's our inlet pressures. We can pair them to the working pressure at the meter and our working pressure at the appliance. So, that's all our tests complete on the boiler. The last thing we need to do now, because of the new building regs, is if I had a magnetic filter, I'd need to be cleaning and checking that. But this boiler was installed in 2013 and hasn't had a magnetic filter in its whole life. So it's going to be interesting to see what the water quality is like. So I'm going to be taking a water sample and then I'm going to be showing you the tests we need to do with that. So let's get on with that then. Again, make sure you put LDF on your test nipple. Make sure it's not leaking. Wait for a few seconds and then wipe off the excess. Now, how are we going to check this water quality then? First of all, what I'm going to do is I'm going to fill up my turbidity tube to see what colour I've got, to see if it is uh, contaminated. And then after I've filled that up and checked it, I'm then going to use my AD Pro Check kit to see if there's any inhibitor and stuff in it. So my first task is using the bleed, I'm going to fill my turbidity tube up. So the first look at the quality of this water, it looks pretty damn clean considering it's never had a magnetic filter on this system since it, this boiler was installed in 2013 did I say? Yeah, 2013. So uh, let's have a closer look. So you can see the water there from the side. So if we look actually down, you can see that water is really 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 clean so uh, shall we see if there's any inhibitor in it then so this is my water out of my central heating system i've just put it in this little tube what you get with the ad1 and we're going to try these fernox express inhibitor test strips first so let's take the lid off here let's uh, get one of the test strips out So basically what we're going to do now is dip it in the water for two seconds. One, two. Shake it off. And then test it with the strips. So we can see straight away. Looks like there's about 20 parts per million of inhibitor. So according to these Fernox Express inhibitor test strips. I'm going to need to put some inhibitor in this heating system. So let's see what the AD one says and see if they come out any different. Now let's try our AD test. First thing I need to do is say it's a new test. Next thing I need to do is go into the Dropbox box and say we're in the United Kingdom. We also need to put the postcode in. So we'll put the postcode in and the number and then we need to press done is that the address it is click on that then it's saying is it a new installation service so we need to put service and then click next and then saying is it a combi which it is so we'll click on that and we go on to next it then says job reference and we need to go and scan the boiler so I'll go and scan the boiler, I'll be back in a minute. So you can see we scanned the boiler, so I need to go on to done and next. 
Do we have a filter? Well, we don't. So we press no and we go on to next. And now it says take the sample and here's our sample. So we've done that. So we press continue. Now it wants to take a picture of the sample. So you can see I've taken the picture. I can now press clear our yellow, press continue. It now says dip the test strip into the water. So we, first of all, let's get a test strip out. Open the water and we need to dip it in. All the way down to the bottom. Leave it for a couple of seconds. And then shake off the excess. Water's now done with. Press continue. We now have to leave it for one minute to dry. Now the one minute is up, so what we've got to do now is place the test strip, if you can grab hold of it, onto the card and line it up. Get the phone out of the way. So you can see that's in line. So we press now continue. And now we've got to get this in line. So it takes three pictures. And you can see the result it says. It says test result inhibitor recommendation. It says uh, corrosion is a pass and it says pH is a recommendation. So that's what we need to do. The inhibitor will change the pH when we add it in. So we press continue. We can write some notes and I can submit that to AD. So the results for this one is also saying we need to get some inhibitor in. So I think we need to get some inhibitor in. So that's how you can do the test using this AD Pro check. I can then email the results to the customer to prove once we've got the inhibitor in the system and it's passed, we can then email it over to the customer and everything will be tickety-boo. That's testing the water, which we now need to do on installation and service. Now, just to finish off with this very long video, are we responsible for any other gas appliance in the house if we're just servicing a boiler? Well, according to Appendix 5 of our Unsafe Situations Procedure, IGEM G11, we're responsible for appliances we encounter. And it all depends on whether you've done a tightness test, and you've done a tightness test and you've allowed air in, or you've not done a tightness test. Now we've done a tightness test, but we haven't allowed air into the system. So basically, we are responsible to do a visual test of the cooker we've encountered in the same room as the boiler. Now, we don't even need to turn it on, it says, unless we have concerns, and we don't even need to move it out unless we have concerns. So it says visual apparent defects only. So we're looking for the size of the room. Is it more than 10 meters cubed? But we've got a back door as well here in from the kitchen to outside. So that makes it, is it larger than five meters cubed? Yes, it is. Does it have an openable window? Yes, it does. Uh, so uh, any signs of scorching anywhere? Does it look unstable? We are a little bit close to the uh, edges here, but is there any signs of scorching? No, there isn't. So on our visual apparent defects only for this range, there isn't any. So that's when you are responsible for other gas appliances, when you've encountered them while you're servicing a boiler. Anyway, Hope you've liked it, and I'll catch you on the next one. But if you want to see any more, have a look at this video here.